Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are alive. You're not dead. You didn't stay in the grave. You weren't defeated by sin, death. You overcame by your own blood, and we overcome through your blood, through your sacrifice. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's so nice that we don't, we're not like, you know, serving some dead religious... Because there's only two religions in the world, the right one and all the wrong ones. <laughs> Jesus is king, and he's alive, and we can know him, we can walk with him. Yes, uh, kids are... Yeah, just in a minute, okay. God's not dead, he's alive. Thank you, Jesus. And if he's alive, that means he wants to do stuff. And if he wants to do stuff, that means he wants to do stuff through you. For us, through us, through his body. That's why he's with us. Thank you, Lord. Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who don't know, it's, we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday today. So this is the, the celebration and the recognition of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And as we've mentioned many times, it's the coming of the Holy Spirit was what God was working towards all the time. Jesus went to the cross. He paid the price to pave the way so that sin and death and disease, both uh, spiritual, which is sin, in every way, shape, and form could be defeated so that his life could be manifested through us. And that would happen when the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus, you know, after doing all these miracles and walking with his disciples, and the, he sent out his disciples who operated in his power, in his authority, delegated authority. So the Spirit was, was there, but the Holy Spirit was not abiding in them. And Jesus told those disciples, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. Well, let's read it. In Acts 1, verse 4, says, And being assembled together with them, so Jesus had risen, and he was with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So something was so important. This promise is the promise that God, throughout the Old Testament, that all of the prophets dreamed of, that everything was in anticipation, waiting for the day when this promise can be fulfilled. The coming of the very Spirit of God into people, to believers. So wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you will receive power which is in the Greek there, the word, um, which means basically miracle working ability. The power of God, because it's the Holy Spirit, it's God's power, but he comes and lives inside of us. So you will receive miracle working ability, power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So you'll be witnesses for me. Why, when God comes, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, why we receive power? Because God is king, right? He's the king of the universe. The king has authority and power. So when he moves in and he comes into your life, he doesn't leave part of himself outside the door. He comes in with all his power, all his ability, all his love, all of who he is affects us. If we are believers then we are the, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us. The very, that's why we, the people, are called the church. Where two or three are gathered, I am there. I mean, God is within every believer, so God's spirit, so our, we actually become the temple of God where God dwells. Where God dwells, there is life. There is healing. There are miracles because that's, that's why Jesus lived the way he did. That's why he did everything he did, because he could. And because he's love, he did. You see, if he wasn't love, maybe he wouldn't. But when Jesus in Acts, you know, is walking the earth in Acts 10, 38, it says he was going everywhere, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the enemy. 
by the devil. The, the devil, the enemy, is the one who oppresses, steals, kills, and destroys. Jesus came, he said, I've come to give life and life in abundance. In other words, God is not stingy, squeezing out a little, here's a drop for you, here's a drop for you, yeah, just enough to scrape into heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within you because that's where God dwells. That's where he reigns. So if we are believers and we have given the Holy Spirit access to our life, then he reigns. And he reigns through our faith in him. That's the red carpet on the floor that's saying, God, you are well, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You know, we can sing a song, but if the reality needs to be reflected in our heart. And if we have the red carpet of faith and obedience to God, where we, we, we want to do His will, Holy Spirit, come so that you can empower me to do your will. I mean, the Holy Spirit then will come to help us. He'll do the miracles, right? We have to put steps of obedience and faith, right? Jesus said, you go into all the world. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, preach the gospel, make disciples. That's something we need to do. God won't do that for us. But he equips us and empowers us to do it. Right? So he works through his body, through his temple, where he reigns, where he dwells. We are his body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's got no plan B. We, we do it or it doesn't get done. Believers, I'm saying believers. Every, everywhere there's a believer, okay? Everywhere there's a believer, they're part of his body with, uh, that needs to function, that should take orders from the head, the, the brain of the head, the spirit of God, which is the, okay, the head. Jesus is the head of the church, right? You don't want to be running around without a head. That's not a good idea. That's, you're not going to get very far. If you try running, you, you lose your head, you're in trouble. <laughs> you, you're going to be, you know, okay, I'll stop. So... Jesus is the head. You don't want to run around not being connected, abiding in him. What does that look like? It looks like what, how most people in the world are living. Like people running to and fro and here and there and everywhere and just not satisfied. No peace. No, even though they may seem to have it all that this world has to offer, but still, the peace, the assurity of God and his provision his life, his healing, his... You see, that comes from looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You can't find it in the world. They don't teach that in university. You can go to university and learn some skills to, to function in, in the world, and all, but the skill, the true heavenly skills God wants to give us comes through faith in his name. You know, the Holy Spirit wants us to experience the fullness of all he has to offer us, right? You, you believe that. Do you think God has a, as some people put it, a junior Holy Spirit? You know, you can have a little miniature version of God. And yet God, there's no miniature version. He is who he is. I am who I am, God says. You know, when Moses was all concerned about going to Pharaoh and, you know, because God appeared in the burning bush and spoke to him and Moses was just, you know, in the wilderness there just, and God saying, hey, I want you to go liberate all of your brethren, who, they're slaves in Egypt. And Moses is like, are you talking to me? <laughs> me? <laughs> I can't even speak properly. He was stuttering. He had a stuttering problem. He had a speech impediment. And he was like, me? And God was saying, yeah, you. And sometimes we do that with God. We think, what? Heal the sick, raise the dead, go, and you're my ambassadors. And we think, what, me? Do you know who you're talking to? Are you talking about me? He's talking about you. Because he is the special one. He is the one in whom is life, and there is no life separate from him. So if life, if, if he always carries his life with him, that means wherever he is, the potential for the life that is in him. Okay, God's will is always to bring life, right? This purpose, the Son of God has manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil and, um, and bring life in its place. And that's why everywhere Jesus went, he was constantly uh, healing. He was constantly imparting words of life and inspiring people's faith and raising the dead. Whatever compassion motivated him, the love of God, 
The love motivated him. It says, you know, he, he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. And then he was going and he was healing and he was setting people free. He was casting out devils and he was doing everything he did because he's the embodiment of love. He's the embodiment of God's will. So there need be no question about what is God's will. Will this help, heal, deliver, bring freedom? It's God's will. You see, there is, um, in one of the songs actually, it talks about you know, taking up your cross and, and all of this, but we need to understand what Jesus bore and what we don't have to. But then we have to understand what we are to bear. What we are to bear is doing God's will. That's the cross Jesus is referring to. And Jesus said, uh, no, not Jesus, sorry, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, uh, or a 316, one of those. He said, all that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, for example. If you live like Jesus, which every believer should be, right? You know, we, in other words, we're doing what Jesus would do. If we're in a situation and, you know, we, we should do what Jesus would do, right? So, um, Okay, explaining that little parenthesis, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> this is just, I'm doing this on purpose. This is a test. So who, who, who knows where the thread was before I did that little tiny parenthesis? I'm just testing you. I, I know, but I'm just seeing if you know. What was I talking about? <laughs> what? Paul said, yes. Okay, all the desire. Thank you. Okay, that's it. See? Okay, I'm out of you in the prize. So, no, no. Okay, here we go. So, um... The cross, okay, that Jesus has for us is to do his will, which is what Jesus exemplified when he was here. He, he picked up his cross long before he picked up that wooden cross. In fact, if he hadn't walked with the cross of not my will but your will be done and with that attitude and lifestyle, he would not have picked up that wooden cross and you and I wouldn't be saved. Okay, so the fruit of his obedience is that you and I are saved, that we can know God and walk with God. So through one man's obedience, Scripture tells us we are all partakers of his life now. Look at the fruit of one person, Jesus, his obedience, because he came as a man. He's, he, he came as man, not as God. He had to depend on the Holy Spirit just like we have to. He learned obedience through the things which he suffered. He is able to comfort any of those who are afflicted because he, he knows what we have a high priest who cannot, uh, who, who, is, who is touched by the, the weaknesses and the things because he knows what it's like to be human. He's been in the flesh. He's limited himself to walk in the flesh just like we do. So he understands. And, but he, he's made his life available now. So now... The cross that God has for us is, is to do His will because it's not always comfortable to, to do God's will. Right? It's not always comfortable to do unto others as you would want done unto you. When you're in your nice easy chair and just relaxing and, and God says, you know what, hey, maybe you should... Um, uh, look, Jesus... But the fruit of obedience, the fruit of doing God's will is lives. It says, in Proverbs, it says, um, uh, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. So the fruit that we are to bear will result, you know, through our doing God's will will result in lives transformed. And Jesus led the way. He gave his life, and look, we're, we're all here. And now he looks to us, and he says, okay, what are, he says, are you going to now walk in my footsteps? All right. Okay, well, let's, let's read about Pentecost here, the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So we know that Pentecost, we're celebrating on this Pentecost Sunday is the coming of the Holy Spirit, right? So this is when it, the original, when it happened. Acts 2 verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. In other words, they were in unity. They were of one heart, of one mind, of one soul. They weren't like, you know, you know looking at their neighbor like this and that and the other. They, they were focused on Jesus. And that doesn't mean your neighbor's perfect. It doesn't mean you're perfect. <laughs> it just means they're looking unto Jesus. You see, that's the secret. You can go through stuff and people can treat you bad and say stuff and all this kind of thing, but we have the... Look, you can't always choose what you go through, 
but you can choose how you respond. You can respond to anything, any negative thing, by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when we're looking unto Jesus, faith begins there, right? He's the, he's the author, the creator. You can't have faith without looking to Jesus. Faith without looking to Jesus is, is a religious um, pretending thing. You know, it's like we say the right thing, and it, but, but in our hearts we have no expectation because we're not looking to Jesus, the source. We're not plugged in where we're looking to the source, and we're just trying to do stuff separate from him. But the Holy Spirit wants relationship. The, when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit, we're not just talking about, here, here's some power, go have fun. It, it's him he comes. The God himself comes and makes his habitation with us. And if we are the habitation of God, he, he desires relationship. He desires that love exchange. He desires those times and the conversations and the talking and the listening and the, you know, you make time for what you love or who you love, right? So if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, guess what? The, 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 the focus of our heart and, and the time that we focus and spend with him, whether you're in a room and the door is closed or you're walking down the street, the focus of our heart and our, and our, and our prayer life and our conversation with God will be always a focus of ours because we love him, right? Because we love God. So the coming of the Holy Spirit is not just God throwing in his power and he stays behind. He, come, he comes. So the baptism, the immersion of the Spirit is about a, a greater place of fellowship, pressed down, shaking together, running over to where just the Holy Spirit oozes, or not ooze, that does. <laughs> he flows like a river of living water, right? That's what the scripture tells us, that if we have faith in Jesus, we walk with him, that out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, out of our innermost being? That means what is the focus of your heart? Where is your heart focused? Where are you looking towards? Are we really looking to Jesus? Or do we really carry that expectation of his miraculous life to be made manifest, to touch, heal, deliver, to set people free to the point of where we actually do it? Because if you have that faith and expectation, we will live accordingly, right? Faith, faith without works is dead, right? So we can see what we really believe by what we're doing, okay? Now tomorrow is gone, yesterday, today's a new day. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus didn't say, uh, well, that scripture doesn't say, yesterday was the day of salvation, you missed it, sorry, tough luck, go to hell. That's not what he said. He said now, right now. Okay, past, you can't do anything with it, but now is the day of salvation. What we thought and did in the past, what we, what we did or didn't do, what, okay, whatever. Now, Jesus is here. And if Jesus is here, there is life. There is hope, there is freedom, there is healing, there is everything that he carries with him and he lives in you if you're a believer so when the day of pentecost had come they were all with one accord in one place so notice first of all the coming of the holy spirit that was able to fill them to the point where even spoken tongues the spirit just took over it was because they were yielded to him right their heart was in a position their lives are in a position that it's about God, His will, Jesus, your King, yes, sir. That, that was the position of their heart. The Holy Spirit is not a, uh, our, our little genie that we go visit sometimes. Okay, I need a new thing. Shh, 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 shh. Here he comes. You know. That's not the role of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit is to walk with Him, to abide in Him, to, that the two have become one, it says in Ephesians 5. The Holy Spirit infuses us when we, when we um, are saved, when we make Jesus Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body, the very body of Christ, his spiritual body. We're part of his spiritual body. And so when we get saved and the Holy Spirit comes, he, he literally rips us out of the kingdom of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of God. And we become part of his body. Remember when uh, in Genesis, Adam, God took you know, one of his ribs and, and, and formed Eve. As a, as a um, 
from my flesh or my bone, that the two would become one as a, as a spiritual parallel, it says in Ephesians 5, of our relationship with Christ. That's what it says, that the two would become one. That's what he has for us. We don't just go to God when we need something, but, but his intention. He, 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 he helps. He, he, he's there, but what his heart's desire and to, to walk in the fullness of Christ is to really open our heart and, and live life with him. Okay, so they were... Huh, we're still on verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place, so the way of their heart was paved and ready. The red carpet of willing heart to do God's will was ready. Holy Spirit, come. That is, that is really what the Holy Spirit's after, you know? Even now, as we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, it's not just a historical narrative, okay? Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. That was written to believers, Christians, okay? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. So God is knocking at our heart, says, hey, I want to eat with you. Hey, I want to take you places you've never been before. I want to take you into a life experience where, where you've never experienced before. You know, there's more. There's more. And how do we know? Because look at the life of Jesus. What did he manifest? What did he show us is available? And Jesus said, John 14, 12, if you believe in me, you'll do the same things I was doing and greater, not less, because I go to my Father and because he go, when he goes to his Father, what happened? He sent the Holy Spirit. So we too would become a habitation of God. That's how Jesus lived, as a habitation of God. But he had to go, pay the price, lay down his life, shed his blood so that we could be saved and be made the righteousness of God. See, often the enemy comes and whispers in your ear, oh, you're disqualified because A, B, C, D, E, F, B, Z, right? You're not worthy. You are you, 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 you. He tries to get you to look at you, but that's looking in the wrong place. Because Jesus has cleansed us, if we're believers, Jesus has cleansed us, and Scripture tells us we have become the righteousness of God. We have, it's, it, we, it's, what, it's our DNA now. It's what we have become. It's not a matter of earning and deserving. Now, as we walk with God and we give place to the Holy Spirit and we lay out the red carpet of a willingness to do His will, then obviously our, we're going to see Him more clearly. And so our actions are going to be more filled with all the life that is available in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean He's not available right now. Right does no, doesn't matter where we are. You understand? He is, he is available, but he's really after the full, the full package of relationship. Okay. And suddenly there came, verse 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, just, just picture it. Put yourself there. Okay? We, we need to do that with Scripture. Because we read that, oh, there's a mighty rushing wind. But just, okay, picture, we're here, we're worshiping God, we're, 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 our heart is directed towards Him, and then you hear this, you know, it's, it, this is a real thing, a real event, okay? It's, it, it's easy when we read words on a page to just kind of put it in the past, but God, everything that is written here is for our experience of today. Okay, I'm not talking about, oh, I want to listen for a wind, but the Holy Spirit, okay, the power the presence of the soul. So a rushing mighty wind, it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. So a mighty rushing wind and tongues, 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 you ever thought of that? Tongues of fire. What if you saw like a tongue over somebody's head there? You know, it's kind of Unusual, right? But the Holy Spirit indwelling the most powerful event in human history, the coming of God into man, that Jesus sacrificed, said it paved the way, and it was depicted with tongues of fire. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus in Revelation is coming back, sitting on the white horse with the armies of heaven, and, and it says like a tongue, a sharp double, his tongue like a sharp double-edged sword. Jesus said, the words that I speak will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words 
will never pass away. He sent his word and healed them. He's called the word of God in John 1, and it says he has set his word as a, as a, as a boundary. He said, so his word is powerful. God doesn't mince words. He doesn't, he's not flaky. He's not um, saying one thing and doing another. He, 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 he means what he says. And therein is the key to our faith in God. God's not a liar. If he promised something and he said something and he said, all you must do is believe and we're believing, he will do what he promised to do. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about, uh, I need to be, um, you know, work for or earn. If you could work for it, Jesus didn't need to die and pay the price. He didn't need to go to the whipping post. If you could earn it, if I could earn it, we could save ourselves. We could heal ourselves. We could, you know, but Jesus paid the price because, because that was the only lifeline. So we are qualified through Jesus Christ. When our faith is active in him, we're qualified. We are, we are the righteousness of God in him. It's a matter of being, not just a doing. But the doing comes from understanding who we are, whom God has made us to be. Okay. Then there appeared... Tongues of fire. So, okay, yeah, the tongues. So the tongues is, is when we speak the word of God. When we believe and speak. You know, it says in Romans 10 that uh, with the heart, a person believes and it results in salvation. But with the mouth, confession is made. Sorry. With the heart, we believe, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made, which results in salvation. So, tongues of fire we have the power to transmit the life of god through our words through our faith and action through our words and what we do tongues of fire and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance now i don't think peter was like sitting there and he said okay now uh, the holy spirit's here let's all speak in tongues there was nobody leading there's no human orchestrator, what do you call that dude who, who's up there uh, leading the orchestra, the, the uh, conductor, right? There was no conductor humanly up there telling people what to do. I mean, the Holy Spirit came, filled them tongues of fire, and all of a sudden they all started speaking with tongues, heavenly language, which it says over in Mark 16, 15 through 18 over there, it says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak in new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So tongues, the, the heavenly language, the, the language of the Spirit of God speaking, praying, worshiping, whatever through you is one of the signs listed right there next to healing the sick, right next to go out and preach the gospel. These signs will follow. So tongues God has set in the church because it is... It is an expression of, okay, well, just look at this situation here. When the Holy Spirit came, they all started speaking with tongues. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit was so uh, overflowing muchness in and through them and upon them that even the control of their tongue was taken over and the Holy Spirit controlled it. Tongues of fire appearing before their head. When the two become one, you speak the same thing, right? Union and unity is about speaking the same thing, being of the same mind. And God is showing us he wants us to be in union with him of the same mind, of the same heart. So we're speaking the words coming out of our mouth, the actions through his body, which is our body. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The two have become one. That's what God's after. This is the significance of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit came, tongues, and so the Holy Spirit just began to speak through them. And that's why tongues is, is just a very uh, precious gift from God, which is basically allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through us, to speak through us. It's listed as a sign in Mark 16 over there because sometimes it says there's different kinds of tongues, diversities of tongues. There's a tongue that you, you know, spirit praying through you as you're just worshiping God and you can worship in tongues. You can just pray in tongues and the Holy Spirit is praying for things through you. You don't know what you're praying for unless, you know, God shows you. 
Um, and there's another kind of tongues. Many people with testimonies of they started uh, speaking in tongues and then somebody who speaks another language understood that tongue and they got saved. And so, you know, John Lake, John G. Lake, he relates an instance where he wanted to witness to these, I think, with some Italian people. And he just went up to them and was, was speaking in tongues with them. And somehow he knew what they were saying. And when he would speak, he would speak, but he didn't learn Italian. Okay, and that may seem, that, that's what the Bible says. There's different kinds of tongues and they're a sign, even for unbelievers. So that type of tongues where you're speaking somebody's language, God wants to speak to them so that they know, wow, that was from God, you know? And so, you know, prophecy is when we use the language that we can both understand and you're, you're telling them what God is revealing. But, you know, tongues, you know, if you don't speak their language, God can still do it, right? So anyway, the Holy Spirit took over even, uh, and they were so at one that their, their tongues were loosed and the Holy Spirit could control. So if you don't uh, speak in tongues, pray in tongues, worship in tongues, and, and, and you would like to, I, personally, I believe God wants everybody, every believer, to, to, um, to flow with tongues. Because, well, first of all, it says right there in Mark 16, these signs will follow those who believe. Tongues is, is listed right there, right? So it's not for the sun, just as healing the sick, just as doing all these things. Tongues is right there. So, <clears throat> and God, because it is edifying, it is just an expression of our oneness with God, allowing Him sway to where He can even pray through us and speak through us, because where two or three agree, it shall be done. God needs somebody to agree with for Him to affect earth just like it is in heaven. Otherwise, everything would already be done. God would, have, God would have already done it if he didn't need us. If he didn't need to work through his body, everything would already be done because God would just do it. But the heavens are the Lord's, the earth has he given to the children of men, it says in Psalms 139, I think. And it says that, um, so he's looking, his eyes roaming to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking whose heart is completely his so he can act through them. So... Okay, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit is giving them utterance. They're not just inventing stuff and, and you know, because it sounds, it's not the babbling kind of uh, things that sometimes people do, but this Holy Spirit gives us utterance when we're truly flowing in tongues. So it's a very, it's a help in our spiritual life, in our communion. John G. Lake said it was the making of his ministry. Smith Wigglesworth, he'd wake up, he'd speak in tongues 30 minutes, read the word 30 minutes, then go in and then come back and pray 30 minutes. So, you know, every um, man or woman of God that I can think of at the moment, you know, the, the beginning of the Azusa Street Revival can be traced right back to uh, Charles Parnham and his Bible school and they were studying this out studying how do we know when somebody's filled and baptized with the Spirit? And they said, they sent the Bible students, okay, let's all research this. And they all came back with the same answer. Well, the evidence every time was that, you know, when somebody laid hands and, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, they would speak with tongues. So if, you do, if you're not um, experiencing that, ask God. Just say, God, give you my life. And by faith, you know, by faith we receive and just start speaking. Just start praising the Lord and then and, and, and expect God to take over any will. That, you know, anybody who's come to me before and they wanted that and we just spent, and we just, uh, every time. So I, I truly believe that is God's heart that we, we do that. And just keep in mind, it's out of the innermost, you know, those who believe, Jesus said, out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit. Out of our innermost being needs to be given to God. That's what he asks. He says, give me your innermost focus of your heart. Give me that place because that's where he flows from. He doesn't flow from, you know, on the side. Jesus, you can have this little piece over there of my life. See, give God the good stuff, right? And it'll, because that's where he flows from. That's when the dynamics of the spirit start exploding for good, okay? By giving that, in, that very innermost place. All right, and then there were different people, Jews, different people from different places, and they heard them uh, speaking their own languages, and they were marveling and saying, how do these guys speak our languages? And, and uh, that was one of the gifts of tongues. The Holy Spirit was speaking to the people 
through the disciples through languages which they didn't learn. And it was a sign to these, uh, to these people. And other people mocked, verse 13, saying, ah, they're drunk. But uh, Peter stood up. Now remember, this is Peter who just denied Jesus three times, right? What happened now? The man who denied Jesus, who was so afraid, he denied Jesus three times. Now all of a sudden, he's standing up in, in front of thousands of people, boldly proclaiming. He raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, know this, listen to me. These guys, we're not drunk as you think we are, since it's only early in the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. God's Spirit is poured out upon all flesh. I meet people and even people who aren't even uh, believers and they have dreams, right? I love going into, you know, pagan festivals or something to witness to these people because, you know, often they'll have a dream and they don't understand it, but God was speaking to them through the dream. So on all flesh, when he says all flesh, he means all flesh. God is speaking to people. Whether it's through a dream, whether it's through their direct, whatever. And he's giving, you know, to, to Muslims who've ne who are very entrenched and, there's, and somebody's praying somewhere, maybe praying in tongues. They don't know what they're praying. They don't know that they're praying for that guy, but God is directing their prayers, praying in tongues, and then God gives a dream in answer to the prayer to that Muslim sitting somewhere who they, they were about to, whatever. And Jesus reveals himself. So this is the power of prayer, the power of praying in tongues. For God knows situations you and I don't, right? Maybe there's somebody somewhere in this. Maybe there's a missionary on a mountain and some there's these cannibals gathering around, whatever. And they need our prayer, but we don't know about it. God knows. Let's pray in tongues. Let us worship God. Give him full sway to even speak and pray through us. And, and he, the two will agree and then it will be done. You know, but so much happens or doesn't happen as a result of prayer and praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. So God has poured out His Spirit. You know, we are to prophesy, it says, and, and to visions, dreams. We need to be open to whatever God wants to do and ask Him and desire for Him to speak to us in, in all these, these ways. <clears throat> In Acts 2, verse 32, this is part of Peter's sermon when he stood up boldly now and he's speaking to all the people, right? So the Holy Spirit gives us boldness, right? Before he was denying Jesus, but now he's speaking boldly. And this Jesus God has raised up and we're all witnesses. Therefore, he was exalted to the right hand of God and received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear. So the Holy Spirit is meant to be seen and heard, and it happens through the believers, through God's body, right? If God is going to be seen, it's through you and me. People are not, can't look to a stone, to a tree, to a statue, to a false religion. They need to see God through us, through the believers, okay? So you are seeing, which you now see in here. And it says, the Lord said, to, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so our Heavenly Father is speaking to Jesus and he's saying, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Can you see in the world the persecution against Christians going on? I'm, I'm, I'm from the United States. I see... All this stuff, okay, it's, it's taking a different form, but I can, s all over the world, Europe, I mean, there's places, these are places that just recently we're seeing all kinds of things. I mean, not to mention stuff going on in, in other countries that have been happening, but there are enemies of the gospel out there. There is a war going on, a spiritual war, and uh, the, the devil's people are taking that war in, in, into the physical realm as well. And, but here the heavenly, our Heavenly Father says, Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now Jesus is sitting down making intercession for us. That's what scripture tells us. Jesus is praying for us. Father, help them to believe, to make the right choice, and then put feet to that faith 
and to be who you've created them to be. And so that's how his enemies are going to be made a footstool, through the believers stepping out by faith to live, to believe, to do what Jesus said. 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So when Jesus paid the price on the cross, went to heaven, he's sitting down and now it's our turn. It's our turn to embody, to live, to eat, sleep, drink, to breathe. Jesus, so that we can be. You know, Jesus said, um, there was a time when the uh, Pharisees were after Jesus and they were saying, you're making yourself out to be God and all this stuff. And Jesus said, why are you bothering me when it says in your scripture that, um, that's in, let's read, uh, in verse uh, John 10, 34. Jesus said, I said, you are God's. So Jesus is saying, why are you bothering me? Because I said, I'm the son of God. Now, that scripture reveals God's intentions for us. I mean, he's, he's God. We're not, but the, we are to embody him. When we embody Jesus Christ, when we embody the kingdom of our heavenly father, who do people see? You or God? They see Jesus, they see God working through us. People need to see God. And so Jesus in John 10, 34 was quoting that scripture where it says, where it's referring to people as gods with a little g, okay? And the purpose of that is of those who will embody God's heart, God's will, who will do what God said to do, who will believe and thus God's kingdom is made manifest on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's intention for us. It, it, it's, this is not a historical narrative. This is to be brought fast forward into the present tense. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day the Holy Spirit wants to set you free in whatever way, shape, or form that needs to take for you. This is the day where the breakthrough begins, and this is the day when the healing occurs. This is now, not tomorrow. Jesus said now. It was always now when people came to Jesus. It was always now. It wasn't later maybe if God's in a good mood. It was, it was now because God's heart is now. He has the ability. God, now. We just don't go by what we see. We go by what we believe. Smith Wigglesworth, he said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what I believe, and I believe in Jesus. Something like that, more or less. So, so he, he, he's, we should be moved Tongues of fire by God, His Word, what He said, what He has embodied. Hey, I'm running out of time. Didn't. Um, so Peter was, was, was preaching to the people in Acts chapter 2, and he told them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent, be baptized, believe in Jesus, give your life to Him, and the Holy Spirit will take you and plug you right in to be part of Jesus, God's very body. <clears throat> and so then, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation, the world. Then those received who received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So this timid Peter who denied uh, Jesus is preaching to thousands of people now, and they, they 3,000 got saved. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, and fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. That's the greatest proof of the love of God entering into a person's life. When they, John 13, 35, Jesus said that, you know, by this all men shall know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. It's not how many miracles you can even work. It's how much love do you have? Do you have love to lay down your life? Do you have love enough to, to you know, all the believe together, sold everything, and, and they were, you see, this is the kind of love the early church was, was launched with from they lived and it says 
And continuing daily with one accord and in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, not on Sundays. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. What does that mean? That means they didn't just leave it for the guy up on the, 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 the platform. They, they weren't like, it was they were living this out. They were walking the walk, speaking, doing, believing, seeing the miracle. They, everybody, the believers were, and as a, as a result, daily people were getting saved, coming to know Jesus, and added, and, and they were loving, man, they were close. They, they believed, sold everything, give to, to add need. That's the proof of a disciple. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit, is God himself coming. You will receive power. Yes, the power, miracle, working ability, heal the sick, raise the dead. But it's also a baptism of love. It's a baptism that, you know, none of that matters if we don't have enough love to go and put it in practice. Right? If compassion doesn't compel us, like Jesus saw the multitude and was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he went, I mean, he was tired, he was on, you know, but he's, he, 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 he gave the people what they came for. This same compassion and love of God needs to motivate us so that we can even utilize our faith. Faith working by love. That's what matters. Faith and works. We can have faith, but there's not enough love to make it work, <laughs> to, to, to do it. Uh, what good is that? Faith without works is dead. So... Love is, the, is what we need to be rooted and grounded in. It says in Ephesians 3, to grow up into the fullness of Christ. Without love, our faith is not going to take us far or anything's not, because we're missing the point. It's about loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving our neighbor as ourself and living from that love dynamic. And we draw our nourishment of love and that causes us to utilize our faith in God, which we all have. If you're saved... If you're a believer, you have faith in God because otherwise you wouldn't be saved. You know, faith by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's looking to Jesus and believing. Okay, so let us give our heart, give our life to God so out of the innermost being can flow the rivers of living water, the very Spirit of God. That is the place we believe. That is the part that God wants, our innermost being, because everything else will follow. If God has the ballast, if God has the directive of our heart, everything else will walk with Him, be a habitation of His Spirit. We will do what He said to do because God has our heart. So they were with one accord and they were... Um, all right, gotta, gotta wrap it up here. Um, so the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit fills us with the power of God because it is... He is God. The, the Holy God lives in us, so He brings His power with Him, and He expects us to do what Jesus said to do, do what Jesus was doing. And um, because it's the same Holy Spirit. Jesus in the flesh didn't do any miracle. It was the Holy Spirit doing it through Him. And He said, I, I don't do anything of myself. It's, it's, it's my Father. It's, you know. So G Jesus, as a man, believed, stepped out by faith, and the Holy Spirit within him did the miracle. We're in the same situation. That's why he said the same works we will do, because the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. All right. Um, let's, let's stop there. Just finish with this. Um, let's give him our heart. Let's believe God. Let's love him enough to obey and step out by faith and do what he said to do. And let us be strong in, in his grace. 2 Timothy 2.1 said, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We can pray, we can fellowship with the Lord, we can walk with him. But when the time comes and the situation is in front of you and somebody needs a miracle, forget all about yourself and what you've done and didn't do in it. Throw, we throw ourselves on the grace and mercy of God, the merits of Christ Jesus alone. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, if you believe, you will have what you ask for. When it comes to help, to heal, to deliver, it's always God's will. And we, we need to be strong in the grace. Jesus said it, therefore, I believe it. 
and we do it. Be strong in the grace. You see, that's grace. It's not about our merits. It's about who, it's about Jesus who lives in us and the access we have in him and the life that we carry. It's all Jesus, his merits. Thank you, Lord. I need to stop there. Okay, Jesus, we, we honor you. We give our hearts and our lives to you. And I just pray each one of us, in whatever way that we're all growing, we are all progressing, we are all growing up into you in all things, as it says in Ephesians 4. And we put ourselves on that path. We put ourselves on the path of your heart, of your love. We give our life to you. And we say, Jesus, here is that innermost being part of us. We give it to you. We enthrone you in that place. That is the only place you can be crowned king in our lives, in our innermost heart. Out of our innermost being, we give that to you and we say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. We say Jesus is King from the depth of our being. We choose to be believers who believe, who step out in faith, who take you at your word because you are not a liar. We choose to be the people who represent you as your ambassadors. Let us move forward in faith and love and trust and experience you in a deeper way every day there's always more you want to reveal of yourself. There's always more of you to experience, to walk into fellowship. And we, we put ourselves in that place where you are our inheritance. Nothing else, like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. It doesn't matter what happens. You are the focus of our heart and you alone by your own merits. If everything else faded away and we didn't understand anything else, the, this one thing we make sure. You are the focus of our heart, our love, and our desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's go and shine his light. Your city set on a hill. Your light shining. And Jesus said, let your light so shine that people may see your good, your good works. Your good works. God work needs somebody to work through. So let us do what our Father wants done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, if anybody needs ministry or something, you're welcome to come for that.